Welcome to Municipal Affairs, where we dive into the issues and opportunities facing municipalities today. And it's that time of year once again. No, I'm not talking about pumpkin spice season. I'm talking about budget season. For many administrations and councils, it's one of the most stressful periods of the calendar year, as every decision, every investment, and every priority is put on the table for discussion. And for municipalities, one of the greatest challenges is ensuring that they can keep up with their infrastructure needs, whether it's water, sewer, transportation, or solid waste management. Today, we are joined by a special guest who knows this area inside and out, Jean Sobolewski. Jean works closely with municipalities to ensure their long and short-term infrastructure needs are met, no matter how daunting the challenges may seem. As Jean recently shared in a social media post, many communities are struggling to keep up with asset replacement costs, often feeling overwhelmed by the sheer scale of maintaining critical services. But with the right plan, a proactive approach, and ongoing strategic initiatives, these challenges can be overcome. Jean will be helping us navigate the complexities of budget planning and infrastructure management offering insights onto how municipalities can meet these challenges head on. Whether you're just getting by or looking to revamp your current approach, this episode will provide valuable strategies to ensure your community's infrastructure stays on track. So stay tuned for an informative and solution-oriented conversation. Are you passionate about local governance and municipal issues? Do you believe in the power of community-driven conversations? Then join us at the Cross Border Network, where we bring together voices from across Canada to shine a spotlight on the challenges and the triumphs of our municipalities. But we need your support to keep the conversation going. Visit crossborderinterviews.ca today to show your support by backing the show monthly or making a one-time annual donation. Your contribution will help us grow and expand our reach, bringing important stories to even more listeners across the nation. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can amplify the voices of local communities. Together, we can shape a brighter future for all. Cross Border Network, where local matters and your support counts. Visit us today at crossborderinterviews.ca. Jean, I want to thank you so much for sitting down and talking about this important uh, discussion, uh, particularly in this sort of unique uh, time that we are, are in, particularly in Alberta, with budget season upon us. Before we get into the crux of the interview, I want to give you a moment and sort of give me a background of who you are and why you are the man to talk about this important issue around <laughs> long-term and short-term infrastructure budgetary uh, challenges. Well, so uh, I, I'll try and do it in about 30 seconds or less. So I, I started my career in public works. I've been in public works uh, pretty much all my life. Um, I uh, was uh, mayor of a, the town of Bonneville for uh, eight years. And before that, I was uh, three terms, nine years as a councillor. So 17 years in total as an elected official. And during that time, I was also a municipal uh, engineering consultant. I was a senior project manager looking after and my my area of expertise was a governance and b um municipal infrastructure and so long-term planning and replacement of water lines sewer lines roads bridges landfills the whole gamut so infrastructure is a uh, is near and dear to my heart and um when i take a look at uh where we are in alberta so i've, I've done an, i've had a number of clients now and one of the big things that I've noticed is that we are starting to reach a, a precipice. In fact, we probably have 20 for the last 20 years, depending on the age of infrastructure. And there's been a lack of support from uh, governments, but also on the municipal side, there hasn't been a lot of diligence for the long-term planning for replacement of infrastructure at end of life. And that's kind of where I started with my little... Uh, my little uh, blog there on on LinkedIn was that as I drive in Alberta and it's budget season now, perhaps while it's it's an immense cost, perhaps attention needs to be given to the fact that the province of Alberta and the federal government 
based on behaviors in the last 20 years, are probably not going to step up to the plate that, uh, that needs to happen in order to replace the infrastructure. The infrastructure itself, it doesn't care. It's got a mind of its own. It's going to deteriorate. It's going to fail. And replacement is going to be necessary. And that opens up that whole gamut. How do you pay for it? How do you prepare for it? So I want to start prior to where we are today. Why don't you think more municipalities took a co uh, concentrated effort to plan for the long-term viability of their infrastructure uh, projects and infrastructure uh, uh, assets? Very simple. It comes down to money. Uh, there's only so much tax dollars to go around. And uh, particularly in the last 10 years, you see especially smaller municipalities, the 2,500 and under, when you take a look at their balance sheets on their audited financial statement and you skim down to the amount of money that they've got in reserves, they may have a capital reserve, an infrastructure replacement reserve, an operating reserve. The sum total of, of the capital and your uh, any kind of a replacement reserve is nowhere near the amount of money that's going to be necessary, even if the province funds it um, or, or the federal government has some sort of a, a grant program to fund the type of infrastructure and the slamming that's going to happen um, probably in the next 25 to 30 years for many municipalities. And it comes down to money. It's all about money. It's all about trying to keep taxes at their lowest. Um, you've probably in your travels know a lot of municipalities that have tried to go with a 1% or the 2% tax savings, and they've done that for the last 10 years. Some of them are quite proud of it. Some of them are, uh, it's a matter of survival to try and keep the, uh, the taxes the lowest, but the taxes are the taxes are the taxes. And as a result of that, your operating reserves and your long-term capital replacement reserves and, and those types of things, tend to be the last on on the line and the and the sacrificial lamb if you want to call it okay so there's a lot to unpack in this conversation and i want to <laughs> try to do this to the best of my ability we are in a unique stage right now because in alberta we're heading to an election in 2025 in october so this is the last budget you just mentioned something that i hear often one percent tax increase zero percent tax increase how do you get municipal politicians to flip the mindset of I'm heading into an election, so I can't increase taxes to the point where we need to properly fix these infrastructure assets in a way that they need to be addressed? Because 20 years ago, they were put in. Now they're coming up for potential collapse because we're seeing municipalities like Wainwright. We see it here in Calgary where infrastructure projects are at the end of their lives and they're failing. How do you get municipal politicians to get outside of the mindset of short-term infrastructure challenges and go into a long-term mindset? So the easiest way to do it and, and the, the most success that I've had is basically show them the numbers, show them where they are show them when that infrastructure happened to be constructed. So whether it was um, a bridge or whether it was a paved road or a water line or a sewer line, it doesn't matter. Provide the cost, because uh, a lot of times those are records, as to what it cost back then. And then project forward, if you can, to 2024. What would that cost if you had to instantaneously replace you know, three kilometers or 15 blocks of that water line or, or the rest of it. We all know that it, it's going to fail uh, more aggressively as, as time goes on. I do have a graph with that, but regardless of that, but there's going to be a time frame, five to 20 year uh, time frame when infrastructure is going to need to be replaced. And then future value, those dollars from present, determine an interest rate roughly, and it's all order of magnitude, so it's not hard and fast, but then in that time frame, 20 years from now, 15 years from now, 10 years from now, whatever it's going to be, there's going to be a value. This is what it's going to cost, likely to replace that infrastructure. Here's the amount of money you have now. Let's put an investment factor on it now because you probably have it in GICs or something to that effect. And here's the amount of money you're going to need. Even put into that equation, 
here's how much money we expect to get from the province of Alberta. And still, here's the bottom line. This is what we're going to need. How do we raise that money? And that's the conversation that needs to happen. In Alberta, we're lucky that we have the ability to, to raise new money if you want to form an MCC, a municipal control corporation, and open up a Tim Hortons or do whatever you want to do with it. You know, there's an ability to raise additional funds, but you have to have that serious, realistic discussion as to where is this money coming from? Because in many municipalities, you're probably not going to be able to raise taxes um, to the extent that you need to. Or you need to put an aggressive plan in place to say, this is how much money we need to sock away every year, assuming that we're going to have a return on investment on our GICs in some kind of, in some form or other. So here's the amount of money we're going to need, and hopefully we'll get the two to balance or be within a realistic time frame. And this is, this is 20, 30 years from now. So this is all future planning. But future planning is great, but there's also the short-term aspect of as well, because Things change. Things change on a moment's notice. Like you could plan for that pipeline or that water line to uh, age out in 10, 15 years, but breaks happen, challenges yep. happen. So how do you plan in a in an era where things are a lot more expensive than they were when they originally were put in? That water line that was put in is probably now. 10 times more to replace it or repair it compared to what, when it was originally put in. So how do municipalities need to get their minds around planning for the future, but planning for any situation that may arise in the future as well? So many already do plan for that. So say, for example, you have a, an operating reserve, uh, generally in an operating reserve, there's a money, there's money that's socked away. So if you have to do an emergency paving, if you have to do an emergency repair, Hopefully, the uh, administration has has done enough work between the finance and administration, have done enough work to basically say, this is this is what we typically could run in, a typical water break in our community. If you've got eight or 12 inch lines, whatever it is, this is what it's cost us. We put enough aside to be able to repair that. But what you have to start looking at on that, and it's a really good point you brought up, because this is what I used to tell my clients all the time. So yourselves as an elected official and as an administration, do you have a policy set aside as to when you're going to, when is the trigger point as to when you need to replace this thing? Is it going to be after one break? I'm talking about water lines. Is it after one break? Is it after five breaks? Is it after 10 breaks on a particular uh, a line where you've got a bunch of repair clamps? At some point in time, you're going to make a decision that you've got to replace this, but you also have to plot on your system and you got to keep track and this is where asset management comes in play how many frequency of breaks are we getting on these old systems or these your ac water lines your cast iron your ductile your pvcs um your pccps is the stuff that i'm used to in calgary where are these frequency of breaks and when they occur what is the detrimental or the um the immediate cost for repair but what is also the consequential costs? So um, loss of service and, and things of that nature. In other words, the unintended consequences of that break. And start factoring in an urgency as to, and planning for an urgency as to when these things will likely need to be repaired. It takes a lot of work. It, it doesn't take a lot of money to be able to do that, but you need to get into that mindset because it's all part and parcel of the same package. Smaller municipalities don't have an abundance of uh, staff members, though. And for someone who's worked in a small municipality, who's talked to many small municipalities, there are no Calgary, there are no Edmonton, St. Albert, Lloydminster, you right. name it, even Bonneville. There's like one or two people. So how can municipalities properly plan and address these future needs when you only have enough staff men or staff hours to adhere to what's going on in the here and now? Does it actually take investment into the municipality to properly invest into the infrastructure in the municipality? So I'll use Bonneville as an example. So Bonneville, when, when I was a councillor, um, so that would have been about 2004, 2003. Um, and and I, maybe it was influencer years, truly. I don't want to toot my horn too much, but Bonneville jumped into that. They um, contracted a consultant 
to provide them with an inventory. This is before asset management became the quote unquote asset management. And they segregated into zones or different type of pipe types. And then they started to keep track of failures and putting, you know, highlighting red dots of where these, where these failures and issues are and aging a pipe. So they roughly have a good idea as the type of zones that they're looking at in terms of where they're going to fail. Small municipalities have that, but they're generally in the mind of, especially if they've got a long, uh, you know, their public work super, superintendent has been there for 20 years. They know the system or their operator knows the system and they know where the weaknesses are. So they foundationally have the start of something like that. They may need to contract somebody to kind of put it on into paper for them, but generally make that next step as to how do we start paying for it? And that is the grand leap because there is no bridge in that cavern right now for many municipalities. Um, many of them have an idea, the infrastructure, they know the breaks and things like that, but they have not gone to the next step as, whoops, in 20 years or 30 years, what does this aggregation of replacements start to look like? Or how can we extend the life of some of this infrastructure? What can we do now? Can we do some cathodic protection or in sewer lines? Can we line some pipes or whatever the case is? So may, many mid-sized cities and municipalities will, will look at towards that. But the smaller ones, they're still going to need help. And this is where a shift needs to happen at the provincial government side. I did a a, an analysis for three villages in Alberta uh, on their infrastructure. And the problem was, is that it, there was a, a wide recognition and there was a development of costs. This is what you're going to need over the next period of time. But they were only getting maybe $100,000 and $80,000 a year in MSI funding. So to replace that water line costs the same in that small village as it did in Edmonton. So roughly around a million and a half dollars or whatever it was total. So at $100,000 a year, you're looking at 15 years to, to be able to repair and replace one water line. This is where perhaps a, a different uh, methodology needs to happen at the provincial level to be able to support these kinds of infrastructure repairs because um, a small village or a small municipality, they'll just turn the keys back to the province and say, here's all my infrastructure debt. And... Um, leave it for somebody else who is likely the neighboring MD or county, they can't, likely can't afford to take that on themselves. And you've got this massive vacancy when, in reality, 60 years ago or 50 years ago, the province of Alberta likely paid the greater share in the construction um, by funding uh, of, that, of that infrastructure. And right now we see a, um, an almost divorcing or... Uh, uh, for some of this infrastructure, particularly on distribution and collection, wastewater collection systems. So for those who are just uh, trying to figure out what MSI is, MSI is now the LGFF, which is the local LGFF, that's the correct. Local, yes. local government fiscal framework, which we've had the Minister of Municipal Affairs on this show, and he said funding is now tied to royal resources. So therefore, if you get better resources, you're going to get more money municipalities. If we don't, then we're going to get lower. So they're saying it's tied to resources now, and that's what the municipalities want. Um, you you did just mention something, and I do want to talk about it a little bit, and that is the aging out of infrastructure. Now, there's going to be a graph that we're going to put up here in two seconds about the deterioration versus time of a of an infrastructure Correct. project. And for those who are listening to this uh, via audio only, the link will be in the show notes, and it will be attached to our website, and you can head over there and check it out. But in your uh, analysis in this graph, you have a zone of minor rehabilitation. Whose responsibility is it to ensure that we never get past that yellow zone, that uh, zone of minor rehabilitation? Does it come down to council's responsibility to ensure that they know where the infrastructure projects are at? Or is it the administration side to understand where we're going to be aging out? So the uh, the minor rehabilitation, I'll go straight to bridges because bridges are a fantastic and water lines, water and sewer lines are, are also another one of those. So minor rehabilitations, if you know you've got some dips and doodles in uh, in a sewer line, it's causing you problems or you've got a, an area with a bunch of tree roots or, or water line where you've got a particularly what I'll call a hot soil and, and uh, you've got a cast iron line or a ductile iron line and and it's just corroding through. 
So you're going to be proactive and you're going to try and prolong the life of that infrastructure because it's an asset that you've got in the ground. You may as well use it as long as you can. Um, you're going to prolong the life of that asset, but it's still going to come to end of life. It's, it's not, it's not a replacement. And with bridges, uh, when, when uh, the minister of municipal affairs in 20, I think it was 20, 12 or 2013 treasury basically came out after they had announced the msi so msi was already announced and all the rest of that they came out in 2013 they borrowed and said no we have not got the oil revenues and all the rest of it we're canceling bridges and our bridge program is done so where we used to uh, pay for a vast majority of the cost on local roads for bridges uh, that that's no more so many municipalities, and I was uh, I serviced one when I was consulting, uh, went proactive and tried to say, what can we do? What's the best thing we can do to try and and do maintenance on these things? Aggressive maintenance to try and defer that million dollars. So can we do two hundred thousand or three hundred thousand dollars worth of maintenance to defer that million and a half or or two million dollar uh, replacement project? And in the chart that I've got there. What it does is it takes you out of the yellow zone and puts you into more of a green zone, but you're still going to go through that deterioration. It's, it's just like your car. You can replace so many parts on it. You can even replace the engine or the transmission, but at some point in time, it's going to be insurmountable and you got to get another one. And that's the same thing with, with our assets. Um, our assets have a design life. And if you take a look at PSAB, uh, the accountants have these wonderful formulas that your your design life or the value of your asset is going to be 75 years and after that it's worth nothing but that is is not realistic because the value of your asset is its usability and serviceability so unless you have to upgrade it because you need to put a you've got a big subdivision or a bunch of subdivisions now in your at capacity that asset should be able to last you as long as it can in its serviceable life and that is the big point that's why we try and stretch these things out. But at some point in time, they're going to come to end of life. <laughs> but this is an, in a perfect world where only one asset is going to be aging out at the exact same, at, at only one given time. But larger rural municipalities, smaller urban rural municipalities, they have things that are aging out at the same time because there was just no proper planning and they just haven't planned. How do you ensure that not all your projects get into this yellow zone and doesn't get past that yellow zone into the red zone when you have four water lines that need to be replaced or two water lines that need to be replaced or three bridges? Because I know some Northern municipalities who are screaming right now that million dollar per bridge is not feasible for them and they're rural and they rely heavily on the resource revenues. That's correct. And so there's there's a there's a couple. There's no perfect answer, number one, because you <laughs> have to understand you have to understand the the infrastructure itself. So, but you raise a really good point. You have a number of these municipalities that say, for example, they may have a water line that that they've deemed needs to be replaced. Well, we're going to be digging a hole. So why don't we dig a bigger hole? We'll replace the sewer line. And then if you've got a storm system in there, we'll even replace that storm line if you have to. And then we'll, we'll put brand new gravel in it, brand new asphalt. And sometimes we'll even replace the sidewalks and curb and gutter. Do you need to do that? Or do you just slit trench or pipe burst and just fix the asset that you actually need to fix? Um, if you've got a concrete sewer pipe and that, that it's showing signs of deterioration, has it failed? Or hasn't it? How many failure points along that thing has it had before it needs to be replaced? Is it working now? And has it worked for the last 30 years? Will it continue to work for the next 20 years? Is there an absolute urgency? Or has somebody come in with an asset management program or, or, or a condition assessment or something to that effect and said, you got to replace it because it's mathematically within the zone? That's one of the focuses you have to take, especially smaller municipalities. You got to take yourself out of that mindset and you have to look at the serviceability of that asset. That water line, are you panicking because you've got two breaks on that water line in a, in a break or a, on a block? And if the answer is no, 
then don't worry about it. Put some more money in, in for maintenance. Realize that you may have another break next winter or whatever the case is. And if you got a water main break, was it a result of your repair? Because, but I won't go down that particular road itself, but let's just go for deterioration. So those bridges, those bridges are a nasty issue because the province of Alberta is still in the mindset, even though they built them, their branch built them 60 to 70 years ago. And um, they built them for 200,000 or 100,000 a pot. And they had a, a master design and they went with the timber piles and, and uh, girders and all the rest of it. And now when you got to go replace them, they're in the million to $2 million. But the province has basically stepped aside and said, no, that's a local road. We don't look after that. We'll give you a little bit of money in STIP, uh, but um, it's not going to be enough. That becomes your responsibility. And that was a decision that was made back in 2013. I can even tell you the minister who was there. Who was it? Let's say it. Let's and, come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's that has been so uh, prior to 2013, there was a lot of grants. There was a transportation grant. There was a lot of grant money that came to especially rural municipalities that allowed them um, the affordability to be able to upgrade their gravel roads to, uh, you know, pave structures or um, to uh, replace these bridges. But over time, that has gradually uh, declined. It has gradually um, departed from us. And as we all know, fundamentally, municipal, uh, as, as a municipality, you are a creature of statute. In other words, you are a servant of the province of Alberta. Ultimately, the province of Alberta, through legislation, governs municipalities. And therefore, what's happened over a number of, of years and time frames is that the province of Alberta, while collecting taxes from uh, residents through your your uh, uh, every every February or April when you have to pay your personal taxes, you're paying taxes to the provincial government. They have drawn away from that, and then they've created the urban versus the rural. So you got your rural assessment and linear and M&E versus the the urban within their their small uh, border lines and and uh, there needs to be different agreements. I mean, there's a whole gamut, but it's all about the money, and it's all about being able to raise money, and it's all about being having having the money and the affordability to be able to pay for these services. So when I go to roads, water, and sewer in an urban set, uh, in an urban area, one of the biggest um, reasons you need to have that infrastructure replaced and you need to find money is because if you don't have schools and if you don't have your hospitals, you're pretty much not going to be a municipality any longer. And schools need to have that infrastructure and so do hospitals in order to be able to operate. The instant a hospital or a school has no sewer or no water, boom, they're pretty much closed down. Okay, you just... You you just mentioned that if we don't have the infrastructure, municipalities are going to struggle. Are you saying that the cause for the amalgamation of smaller urban municipalities into their rural counterparts is because they just can't afford to survive anymore? Some of them that has been the case, of course. Um, I know I know some small villages and and small towns that have had no choice. Uh, but to fold into uh, an amalgamation simply because they don't have the, uh, the the population or they had a declining population. They've got declining revenues and especially and holding taxes at zero percent. We'll use that as an example. We all know the costs of procurement of fuels and procurement of supplies and things like that. Wages, they always go up. They're always increasing. And if you can't at least compete and and uh, um, make sure that your revenues equal your expenses in terms of your your uh, um, your level of service that you want to provide. Uh, something's got to give, and there have been some amalgamations that um, have have occurred just simply because they can't afford to keep the lights on, and that's that's a, an unfortunate reality. But when they amalgamate or when they when there's a dissolution, it becomes somebody else's problem. So that infrastructure problem hasn't gone away. Those pipes in the ground and those pumps are still going to continue to pump. They're not closing and, and turning off the lights. And that's my that's my whole 
um, I guess, uh, essence for needing to re have a realization for a long-term plan. It really does fall on the shoulders of a of the uh, of the elected officials and the administration because somebody else, even if you if you dissolve or you turn the keys in, somebody else is going to inherit that, and it's going to be somebody else's problem. And they still need to do it because those residents are going to continue to demand those services. And those services are going to cost money to be able to provide. So barring the province waking up tomorrow morning and saying, you know what, you're right. Gene, you're right. We haven't been funding the uh, municipalities correctly. We're going to give bring back the STIP program. We're going to give, we're going to bring bridges back under our jurisdiction. We're going to give municipalities a lot more money. Yeah. Barring that happening tomorrow morning, I don't see municipalities getting more money tomorrow morning. So no. with, the, with the resources that they have today, how can municipalities stay ahead of the curve and ensure that their assets don't go into the red zone, which is a to total failure of their infrastructure assets? And very, 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 very good question. And there's no simple answer, but I'll give you a hypothetical sort of solution. Number one, know the state of affairs of your of your assets. Know when likely, where there's a high probability. It's not going to be right to the nearest year. In fact, what I typically do is plan for every five years, right? You're going to do something because that's, that's a window. You can use 10 years. It doesn't matter. But at least know where there's a likely probability based on today's, um, uh, what, what you observe today on your infrastructure, know what you're going to need, and then try and anticipate the revenues you're going to need to, uh, uh, you know, to require to be able to, to pay for that. And that's usually where the brick wall, you just come slamming into the brick wall, the brakes have failed and bang. Because half the time it comes down to what are our critical levels of service that we have to provide? Where are we spending our money? Are we spending our money on infrastructure or are we spending money on flower boxes and swimming pools? Right? And infrastructure isn't just water, sewer, river, or your bridges, roads. It also includes your rec centers. It also includes your, your office building that, that, uh, that you're housed in. So it's a full gamut. And then you've got you've to have that heart to heart you're a municipality. You've been incorporated in whatever year and you're under the MGA. The MGA confers all that responsibility, all that decision-making, all that planning on you as an elected official. And then you need to determine as a group, what's the core, why are we here? What's our core level of service? What are we going to provide? Or what can we no longer afford to provide without assistance? And so keep schools open, keeping hospitals, um, you know, those are generally, you know, healthcare and health and welfare of your, of your systems. Those are primary concerns. So water, sewer, roads, basically. And then afterward, um, your recreational services. What are you providing as recreational service? How much is it costing you? Where, uh, you know, if, if we are not, or we can no longer afford to provide those types of services, um, why not? And where can we get funding if we need to keep them open? Like, say, for example, our rec center, you build a brand new rec center because everybody was into that in the last 20 years. So in 50 years or, or 60 years, when that ice uh, rink, it's, it's infrastructure is in total failure and you got to rip up the concrete or your roof is completely falling apart. What are you going to do? Are you going to replace it? Or are you going to say, you know, we can't really provide that service or what's our alternative? Do we provide, you know, where, where's the nearest facility? So it's complex. It's not easy, but it all starts with how much money do we got to raise? It, it, it comes down to chase down to the, to the dollar. It's all going to be about funding and where, where do we shift our priorities or where do we start having the dialogue with the province to basically say, Look for for especially for us municipalities under five thousand or under twenty five thousand or twenty five hundred or under a thousand. Uh, the bank, the piggy bank, is going to break here, and we're not going to be able to sustain ourselves. We're not going to be able to have the uh, the high mill rates and the high residential because we just don't have the commercial. We have zero industrial, and it can we can no longer afford this stuff. 
many, not an easy answer. Not an easy answer, but it leads into the next question, which is not going to be an easy answer as well. CAO, city managers, director of finances, mayors, councilors, Reeves, you name it, are all getting ready to get that big giant budget binder sometime this month, maybe next month, potentially in November, depending on when they officially start budget talks. Usually it starts around Thanksgiving from my experience, but this is the time when they start getting prepared. What is the one thing that you hope municipalities, those smaller municipalities who are facing those budget crunches right now, do this budget cycle that they haven't done in the past to ensure that they stay ahead of that curve? Start Besides reach to, out to you and get you to come in and audit their finances a little bit. Well, you know, because I don't I don't do a, a finance audit. I, I start with with the, the basics. Um, do you run a fire department or don't you? Um, do you have a rec facility? Don't you? How much water and sewer lines do you have? Do you have a wastewater treatment plant? Do you send it off site? Are you a regional? Um, do you get water from a regional supplier? Or do you have uh, your own water treatment plant and you're pulling out of wells? All the rest of that good stuff. And then you take a look at it and you say, okay, well, here's the age of it. So use the PSAB 75 years or use 100 years. I don't, it doesn't really matter. But quick and dirty plot as to where you are and where is your existing reserves at? Because it's, it comes down to money. And if you're going to have a major financial gap, use the next 15 years, uh, 10 to 15 years to undertake an, a, a, a huge lobby to try and get some funding so that you can start to repair and get a handle on, on how you're going to pay for this stuff. And then you have to have a heart to heart as to what's our core services and the most uncomfortable discussion. It's probably not going to happen this budget cycle, but maybe um, when you're undertaking your strategic plan next year with it, with a new council, um, take a look at that strategic plan and say, you know, do we need to alter our goals or alter our priorities because infrastructure, which has long been gone and buried and and uh, forgotten about until it, you know, the, the hole or you've got a, a water main break or the potholes start showing up. <laughs> um, my message to everybody is you can't forget about this stuff. We've been forgetting about it for the last 15 years. And, you know, for those that haven't, kudos to you. But when I take a look at your, your audited financial statements, and you just pull up anybody in the province of Alberta, BC or Manitoba or whatever, you'll see, especially from the 5,000 and under, it's the same tail of the tape. You've got 700,000 or maybe you've got a million dollars in your future capital, if you want to call it that, or your capital reserve fund. And maybe that goes to, to the instantaneous, when we have a water main or we got Project X, that's how we're going to fund it. And that's very short term, and that that's that's where you're you you need to have a, a more critical thinking and a long term thinking that that's not going to be sufficient, and there needs to be a, a substantial plan or a mechanism to be able to to recognize that what you've got in your municipality, it's going to come to an end soon, or it's going to come to an end at some particular point in time. Even that brand new water line that you put in that HTPE or that PVC. 80 years to 100 years, it's probably going to be at its point that it's not going to be able to sustain itself and it's going to have to be replaced. Well, what is the program? I know many of the counselors and I will go, well, I'm not going to be around at that particular point in time. So why do I care? I'm interested in the here and now I want to get reelected. Or, but all it is is shoving off to somebody else in the future. And my whole point when I, when I wrote that as an underlying message is that there has been a lot of bulldozing to push all these problems to somebody in the future. Well, we're starting to arrive at that that future window that we got to really start thinking about, you know what? Had we saved in the past, we're not going to be in this pickle. But now that we are we are where we are, how do we overcome it or what are we going to need to overcome it? And just start planning, getting in the mindset as to what you need to do. How do you sell that to people though? Because Buying but the buy-in from council is one aspect of making sure you long you plan for the long term of any infrastructure project. But during the last provincial election, I said I heard it best from a mayor who I was speaking with, and he said, um, 
those aren't the things that people show up to for a ground breaking ceremony or a ribbon cutting. They don't show up to an infrastructure project groundbreaking ceremony because it's not something that they use on a day to day basis. So unless you have buy in from the community saying we're putting money aside to invest in the long term viability of our community, you're not going to potentially get reelected or your community is not going to buy into your vision, your strategic plan, your budget. So how do you get people to come to your side of the table and say, you know what, we need to start investing as a community, not just as a council. Yep. And it comes down again to cost. Here's, here's what it's going to cost in your pocketbook, but it also comes down to a proactive. Um, I, I remember a lot of times a budget meeting, we would have a budget meeting. We may have a tax increase of 1% or half percent or whatever it was. And out of 7,500 people, three would show up or two would show up. That's you know? that's a lot for some municipalities. <laughs> right. But the the uh, there needs to be a, a bit of programming that involves the public because the public, it's going to be, here's where our deficit is and your taxes need to increase 5% or 2% or whatever the number comes out to, to be able to handle that and manage that for the next next two years. And that 2% is on top of everything else. That is a tough, tough sell to be able to drop on the public. They're going to go, they're going to go nuts and say, no, we need to um, streamline. We need to have our economies of scale. We, you know, all the old arguments, <laughs> but what needs to happen is a harmony or my suggestion is a harmonization and basically going back, especially with that strategic plan, because that's a beautiful um, document to be able to start that public um, analysis because the public is usually involved on the tail end of the approval of the strategic plan. And basically saying, look, what core services are important to us? What is important to you as a community? Because Here's the reality, folks. In the next 30 to 50 years, we're going to need to fund, and I'm just going to pull a number out of the hat. We're going to need to fund, in our small little community of 1,000, we're going to need to fund $30 million to offset our infrastructure debt. What's important to us? Here's how we can partially fund and rely on the province for another, another portion of that. But the reality is, is that something has to give. Do we continue on the same trajectory or do we need to change um, our core level as a service and start having that difficult discussion? So I, I had a, uh, a discussion one time with a, uh, um, a counselor, who's a rural counselor, and essentially it came down to a similar exercise like this, not quite as in depth, but it was essentially you need to raise on, on your taxes. It was a certain value. And to that particular farmer, it was worth, I think, $2,500 $2, annually as an increase in taxes. And this particular individual was a, a large rancher. So that's his assessment was very large. And I said, $2,500. I said, that's three cows that you're going to sell at auction. Three cows. So are you telling me that's not affordable? And being able to undertake that so that you can afford to reinstate and replace the infrastructure, in fact, theirs was a fleet issue. <clears throat> and I said, to be able to replace your fire trucks and your graders and the other equipment that needs to happen because graders, big, big one, you know, for, especially for a lot of rurals. Uh, when I first started, we were at 300 or $350,000. We're now 750 to 800,000 for that same grader. And that's almost um, bank breaking and something has, again, something has to happen. Your levels of service, are you gonna hit that road every two and a half weeks or are you gonna go to three weeks? Are you gonna have a rover? You know, there's so many things that you have to talk about. And that happens at the administration level, that happens at the council level. And it also has to include in that third circle of communication, the public. And they're hard and they're difficult discussions. And it's not about, raising taxes um it's all about our core level of service and and what can we afford and what can't we afford before i get to my last question i want to just ask an open-ended question for your sake um sure 
what haven't we talked about that you want a mayor who's listening to this in small town Alberta, Saskatchewan or Manitoba mm -hmm. or British Columbia, where we have a lot of listeners that you wish they, if they take one thing away from this conversation around infrastructure and planning for the future and starting today, rather than two years from now, what's the one thing you hope they take away? And what's the one thing you want to get across that we haven't already? So the biggest thing, especially if I'm speaking to an elected official is have you realistically um, looked at your strategic plan and incorporated this, um, you know, this future headache? Has that been dealt with in some form and has it honestly been dealt with? Um, there are so many strategic plans because your strategic plan is what your CAO and your administration in a perfect world, that's what they use as their roadmap for the next five years or next 10 years or 15 years. And decisions that are made at council tend to or should be reflected in the strategic plan in some form or other, right? In other words, there's there's some reference to it, especially for the long-term planning. So have you honestly tackled it? Or is your strategic plan full of things like, well, we have to do this water line for the next 10 years, or we want to build the skating rink, or we want to do this or do that? And have you honestly taken a look at um the brick wall that you're approaching and you may not have the brakes to be able to stop you and that's the one message i have to them have you honestly taken a look as a council so not as an administration but as a council have you got a robust strategic plan in place that encompasses this because if you don't that's 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 problem number one and you don't even need to know you know, where, where your deficit is or all the rest of it, you can, your administration in half an hour or less can come up with a massive number that's going to scare the heck out of everybody. But you need to start addressing it as a group and say, hey, we, are we planning for this? Because if you're not, if it's absent, then the big takeaway is perhaps maybe you need to start thinking about it. Okay, so the last question encompasses basically what you just said, that big magic number of we saw last year a municipality in the lower interior of BC, a Soyuz, come out with a staggering tax increase of over 39%. I think it was like 39.2%, if I'm not mistaken. And that was to address some of the infrastructure challenges, water challenges, most importantly, that the municipality was facing and they had to pay for it. Now, they were being proactive. I had spoken to the mayor prior to that increase, and they were talking about this two, three years beforehand because they knew that it was coming up and they needed to, to address it. How do you balance the need with the political risk? Because people want to get reelected unless they're going out on a high and saying, you know what, I don't need to be reelected. I need, we need to do this for the long-term viability of our community. What do you say to mayors or Reeves or councillors or elected officials or even CAOs who say, we just can't do it, Gene? Like, we would love to be able to say three to 5% is good, but in an affordability crisis where we are in Canada right now, people can't afford three or 4%. Heck, here in Calgary, where I live, our taxes went up 7% and the sky was falling, for God's sakes, but yep. we still move on. So how do you get people around the idea that you need to do it, even if it does mean you're not going to be reelected? You see, and that's the and that's the trick. So when I was a uh, I was a director, and there were two communities where we were bringing water line, and the first thing I said to them is, "I uh, your your existing water supply system. Here's what it's going to cost, and it's still going to be." um your water still going to look like iced tea right because it was it was pretty bad or we're going to bring you in um clean water and it's going to be from it's it's going to be almost pristine water um some of the best in alberta <laughs> i said so the caveat was it's going to cost money your taxes are going to go up specifically this amount of money to be able to pay for this over the next 25 years and I started my dissertation and I was interrupted by an individual who basically said, look, we know what the water is. Can I have a show of hands of how many people are willing to pay and have their taxes increase for this particular project for our benefit? All hands went up. Meeting was over. I expected a meeting in two and a half hours and it was going to get ugly. It was a half hour in duration. So to answer your question, 
it's how it's promoted. So I, I'm, I'm not going to go into the Soyuz as much because I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with, with, uh, with what occurred there as well. But in terms of the public and the service requirement, was there that dialogue in the public? And it, did the public have the ability to basically say, all right, here's the infrastructure. Here's the total infrastructure debt or the, the total that we have to build. Yes, we've got a water, a major water issue. Can we do interim steps to offset that? You know, do we have to have what the engineers say? We got to have the 25 year design life. Can we do something? And the same thing, it's the interim that I used in the bridges. Can we do some interim maintenance? Can we do something interim that's that's going to prolong and you know the need for this? Um, and and are we growing? And is is growth the the impetus for new infrastructure? And if it is, is that growth properly compensating? Because if it isn't, well, that's a decision of council, and that's where the new money comes into the equation. Um, and if you want to it, promote growth and if you want to promote development and things of that nature, it all falls on yourselves as elected officials to be able to make those hard decisions. And the public has to be involved because they're the ones that are going to elect you. And if the public doesn't want it, then you got to come down to the hard discussion of what's our level of service and what's our purpose of being. We have chatted a lot in the last 15 minutes, but I can imagine there's probably someone who's going to be listening to this and saying, why did you ask this? Or how can I reach out to Gene to ask him my question or get him to come to my community? How can people get in touch with you? How can people reach out to you? Because we're always trying to get people connected up because the best practices are ones that are told over and over again. So how can people reach out and get a hold of you, Gene? So they can get a hold of me on, on my uh, my email. Um the SOB 5021 at uh, outlook.com or they can uh, get a hold of me on my uh, cell phone at 780-207-1884. Um, that's probably the best way. Uh, and, and it's, it's the, uh, what I'm hoping for is not necessarily to, you know, to create a bunch of work for myself or anything like that. <clears throat> it's to have those, um, those discussions at your council table. It's to be able to have that realization, uh, you know, whether you're Lloyd Minster or whether you're Kitts Cotty, it doesn't matter. The same philosophical and principled discussion has to happen. And it's where are we? The administration, hey, we're in good shape. We, we have this covered. We got you covered. Well, that's fine. But if you don't have it covered, um, you need to start having that discussion. Do you need to have it at uh, this budget cycle? No, you're probably going to develop a plan over the next five years, but at least through your strategic plan and, and your financial planning and your long-term capital planning, at least you're starting to point that direction. You're aggregating all those, all those cats and you're going to herd them down into one road. And that's, you know, if that goal is satisfied, then my, my reason and uh, and I'd be more than happy to uh, uh, you know to learn that you know a municipality has has taken and, and heeded that kind of advice and started to move in that direction. Well, the link to or uh, Gene's email address will be in the show notes along with the uh, slide that we talked about, the uh, the slide that we were talking about, the sort of normalization zone and the green zone, and the red zone will be in the show notes as well. So highly recommend you check those out. And Gene has something else to add here for a second. So there is one other topic that you may, you know, in this in this thing, and I just kind of hinted at it, you know, through the MCC. Um they're also, if you if you absolutely are stuck on taxation um, and there's no ability to raise taxes, then the other part of that equation is where do you derive new money from? Do you need to aggressively be going and, and looking at opportunities to, uh, if you're near a metropolitan area or something like that, do you try and, and work with developers or something like that to increase your assessment? whether it be commercial, residential, you need to find new money. And that also is a is a, an exercise that is quite difficult. It's quite difficult in discussions, but 
if taxation is not where it's at and you're not going to get provincial funds or or you know the minute the the province is basically saying no we don't have any oil revenues this year then what is your long-term plan for creating new money and that then becomes the uh, the focal point are you on a major highway can you start creating some commercial development you know highway commercial development what it, does it take to entice do you have your own planning rules are they the biggest inhibitor in the town of bonneville uh, we made a conscious decision when ernie isley was the mayor that we were going to reach out and we were going to partner to create development so when we started, we didn't have a lot. When we finished that, uh, when I was finished, we had two Tim Hortons on the east side. We had a, a you know a lot of hotels and and things like that that were newly built. On the east end, we had a uh, or on the west end, we had uh, commercial development. In the north end, we had industrial development. That all created um, the industrial uh, capacity or the the assessment capacity that we needed. We weren't an eighty twenty residential versus commercial we were 60 40 that was our ratio and as and another thing that we did was we also were successful in lobbying for some um, assessment money through the uh, elimination of id 349 i mean that was a that was a long year or that was a long process but as a result of that the town and the city of cold lake and uh, village of glendon received um money directly derived from uh, oil and gas assessment from ID 349 in go. perpetuity. When in doubt, go find new money. That's always a good oh. way. That's what you have to do, right? It's uh, a lot of mayors that I speak to, not only here in Alberta, but across Canada, they're hard up and the province doesn't seem to be wanting to come to the table or the federal government doesn't want to come to the table. So how do you find new money? And I think you have to just take the steps that Gene just talked about. Gene, it, yep. it's an honest to goodness pleasure to sit down with you and chat. I feel like we just scratched the surface when I'm back up in Bonneville, if you're still there, I'll happy, happily take you out for a coffee and we can continue this conversation at one of the two Tim Hortons there. I'm I'm actually in, uh, in uh, just outside of Smoky Lake. I'm in the hamlet of Warspite and I get my water from a regional system and, and uh, you know what, my, uh, my utility fees, um are respective of that and and uh, but i'm happy to pay it because i i want good quality water from the city of edmonton so i mean it's and it's it's a fact of life and it and it's uh uh so yeah if you're ever in the area we'll definitely uh, do coffee or or a lunch or something like that more than happy because i'm very passionate about this particular subject as you can tell well i'll be there tomorrow so thank you so much for this greatly appreciate it gene Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you for tuning in for another great episode of Municipal Affairs. We hope you've enjoyed today's discussion around budget infrastructure with Gene. If you haven't already, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you never miss an upcoming episode of Municipal Affairs. Your support helps us to continue to grow and bring you more important conversations like we had today. So stay connected, stay informed, and we'll see you next time here on Municipal Affairs. Till then. <music>